Hi and welcome to a video for Calculus 1 on continuity where we will specifically be discussing the intermediate value theorem. Alright, so let's take a look at this question right here. It says explain why I know there is a zero between, and this zero and one is important to note that this is an interval. So these are our input values, which in this case, since it's f of x, these are our x values. So I know that there is a zero between basically x equals zero and x equals one for this function. So the first thing I might suggest doing is graphing it. So let's take a look at what the graph looks like. So if I go to y equals and I type in the function, And I'm just going to look in a standard window and see what this looks like. Now why would I know that there has to be a zero, or if we're dealing with real solutions, we're looking for a zero, an x-intercept, a root, and a solution. They mean the same things. So why would I know that there's a zero right there in between x equals zero and x equals one? Well, the first reason is we can see it, right? So let's take a little bit closer of a look and see why maybe numerically or theoretically I might be able to determine why there's a zero in between there. So I'm going to look at a smaller window. So hit window and we're going to specifically look between x equals zero and x equals one. And our y values don't need to be very big either because we're talking about a zero and a zero or root or x-intercept or solution are all the same things when we're dealing with our real solutions. So that's looking at where does this graph cross the x-axis. So my y min, for example, I might just leave as negative one and my y max can be at one. Let's graph this and see what this looks like. So again, my x equals zero and x equals one are the ends of my graph, and so I can kind of see what is happening here. So let's look numerically at why this works, okay? I can see that I'm also continuous between zero and one. So let's evaluate f of zero and see what happens. Let's see what we get. Well, if we evaluate f of zero, it shouldn't take us too long to realize that that function's value then would be negative two. And if we evaluate the other end point, f of one, my function value at one would be one plus three is four minus two is positive two. So I should have seen on the graph that I, my, my graph had the points zero, negative two, and one comma two. Now here's a big if. If f of x is continuous in the interval that you are talking about, so for us that would be in zero to one, if that is a true statement, then I can say what I'm about to say. If we are continuous, we know that we draw our function from left to right without picking up our pencil. We know that for every point in between x equals zero and x equals one, the left-handed limit equals the right-handed limit, which equals my function's value. So I know I'm continuous in there, okay? Now, if I know that one of my function values has a negative output or a negative y value, and another function's out values output gives me a positive value, and I know that I'm continuous like we talked about, the only way to get from a negative y value to a positive y value is to go through what number? Yep, zero. Right, the only way to get from negatives to positive if you are continuous is that you must cross through zero. So I can say that because one value is negative and one value is positive and I am continuous, I know that f of x must equal zero in between there. So I'll write that out for you now. All right, so I just wrote that out for you. Since f of x is continuous between zero and one, and f of zero is negative, like we talked about, and f of one is positive, therefore the graph of f of x must pass through the x-axis between that interval. Again, without this continuity piece here, you can't say that. 
So let me show you an example of what I mean. Let's say here's a graph, right? Here's an x-axis, a y-axis, and I'm coming along here and I'm going to stop there and then start here, okay? And this is, by definition, a function. And let's say this is the same x value. Doesn't matter numerically what it is. All right, well here one output, this yellow one is negative, and here this value is positive, and yet my graph never crosses through the x-axis, right? Well, that's because it's discontinuous. So the other way that you can go from a negative output to a positive output is just physically to jump over the x-axis. That would be a discontinuity. So if I know that my function is continuous in a given interval, and I'm trying to show that I have a zero or root or x-intercept or solution in that interval, and I get one positive and one negative output, I must go through zero. Now this is true for any y value, not just zero. It's just most helpful, really, when you're dealing with zero. So for example, I could show you a graph here, x and y. Okay, looks something like so. And let's say this is a y value of 4, 3, 2, and 1. Okay? So if I know that I have some input here, we'll call it A, and some here, we'll call it B. All right, so at A, my function's value at A, the output's 4, and at B, my function's output is 1. All right, so I know then between A and B, because I'm continuous, right, here's my curve between A and B, if those Y values are between 4 and 1, then I know any value that I pick in between here will also have an output that is between 4 and 1, okay? So I can guarantee, for example, that there is a y value of 3 and there will be at least one x value in between a and b that corresponds to that point that has that output value anywhere between 1 and 4. Because again, if I'm continuous and I'm going from 1 to 4 in terms of y values, the only way to get up to 4 is to pass through 3. The only way to go from 1 to 4 is to pass through 2.89, for example. It doesn't have to be an integer. It could be a decimal as well. All right, so let's apply that to the next question. This is going to show you actually what the intermediate value theorem is, and then we're going to answer this last question. We're below these graphs. It says verify the IVT, which is intermediate value theorem, applies to the interval and find that C value. So that's sort of how we'll end it. So let's look at the intermediate value theorem, and I'm just going to give this some random function here. So let's just make this, um, we can make it a curve, why not? Okay, so here's some function, some function f of x. And if I know that this x equals 1, has some y value up here, and I'm going to actually not only call this 1, but I'm going to call this a and f of a, okay, and 5, which I'm actually going to just call a general b, Let's see if I can go as horizontally as I can, and here's f of b, okay? So now I know that in between f of a and f of b here, and it doesn't matter which one is larger, right? But in between f of a and f of b, if this function is continuous, again, only carrying between a and b, that's your closed interval here. You're only worried about what's between those. So if you're continuous in between a and b, then you know 
that any y value in between f of a and f of b, you will be able to find its corresponding x value. So I can pick any value here. Maybe this is my f of c, we'll call it. And it will guarantee that at least one time that will happen and its c value will be in between a and b at least once. All right, so again, the biggest piece of this is that you are continuous. So if you are continuous on that interval from A to B, then this intermediate value theorem is gonna guarantee the existence of that X value, so we'll call it C for, generally, for generalizing, between your values of A and B when your F of C is between your F of A and F of B, like we talked about in the beginning. So on this second graph, I just sort of labeled some points for you. So for example, maybe this is your A, F of A. And maybe this last point over here is your B, and follow that across, F of B. Again, trying to generalize, so not necessarily caring that that's close to 1 and close to 4, but just for... Um, you know, generalizing sake, we'll call them f of a and f of b. Then this is going to guarantee, because I am absolutely continuous between a and b, right, just showing that you might have some curvature in between there, and that's okay too, that if I pick any y value between f of a and f of b, and in this case they're picking this one, f of c, that that x value, if you follow that down, there will be at least one x value in there where you will have that same y value. And what I wanted to point out in this one is that if you actually carry this over, it looks like there might be two c values between a and b. And that's okay, I'll call this c1 and c2. It's guaranteeing the existence of at least one. And depending on how many turning points, you know, you have in your function might really vary on how many C values you find. Okay? So let's put that into practice for this last question here. It says verify the intermediate value theorem applies to um, this interval 0 to 3 and find your c given f of x equals x squared minus 6x plus 8. And in this case, you're looking for that y value of 0. Again, that's typically when it's the most helpful, but we can use this for any specific y value. So, all right, let's first verify continuity. Again, if you do not have continuity, you cannot apply the intermediate value theorem. And again, I don't need this function to be continuous all the time. I just need it to be continuous in my interval 0 to 3, okay? So how can I verify that? Well, this is a quadratic function. This is a parabola or a U-shaped graph. There are no restrictions to this domain. Every limit from the left equals the limit from the right, which equals the function value. I have no problems. So yes, I have continuity 0 to 3. Check, that's good. So now I want to say, where do I have a y value of zero on this function? So I'm going to set this function equal to zero. And I'm going to solve this equation. I'm not changing this to c yet for a very important reason. I am asked to find c. I can solve this one by factoring. So this will be x minus 2, x minus 4. I tried to make this relatively straightforward. Zero product property applies, so x equals 2 or x equals 4. Okay, now, only one of these is the c value. Why? Because I'm looking from 0 to 3. I'm restricted to that interval. Nothing outside that interval is going to be evaluated or looked at or or you know, a part of my problem. So x equals 4 is not what we're talking about. So I would say my c value is 2. Your c value will specifically be in that interval between a and b. All right, I hope you found this video on intermediate value theorem helpful and how it applies to continuity and some of our other calculus discussions. Thanks for watching.